<laughs> hey, sunny boy. So there are a bunch of these that are not expensive. They are battery-powered active styluses. Styli? It is an active stylus for a touchscreen. So this is designed to work with pretty much any unmodified capacitive touchscreen and stimulate that touchscreen in a small area to provide sort of a stylus experience. Don't drop it. Don't take it apart. Mm. That looks like a normal micro USB. The eraser is soft. A little copper rivet almost at the end of a plastic tip. So, does it have a light somewhere? Blue light? I think that means it's good. Oh, that seems to work. I assume that it doesn't know the difference between the eraser and the pen. I mean, how could it? So that's just going to be a soft... But it feels nice. Like, it feels like a difference that would be worth reversing my pen for, maybe. It's a little slow on picking up the beginning of a stroke. The pen tip is spring-loaded, which is kind of nice. It seems like it does eventually register it at approximately the right location, though. So I've got to keep my hand entirely off of it, which maybe also means it's easier to use in portrait mode. Hmm. My handwriting is not usually that bad. Like, longer strokes, like certain kinds of drawing might be better with this. Short strokes, like handwriting, I was just getting annoyed by it, but I, like, I think with some care you could probably write with this. If I'm trying to just repeatedly go back to the same location, which is a common thing you want to do when you're holding a pencil and drawing. It's like kind of hard to feel where that is. Yeah, it's like pretty far off to the left there. I've seen passive styluses that work on screens like this, but they have to have a large disk. I don't think it's enough just for it to be conductive if it's such a tiny area. This is a small metal stick. It's the end of a dental mirror. Nothing. This is the flat end of a knife. That works. So it needs to be like, I don't know, five, five millimeters maybe? So that's the other approach that you can use. But this, this is just using a smaller point. So it probably is transmitting something. Let's see if it's any different on the newer phone. It is a little better actually. It still has a lot of left-right discrepancy. But if I hold the pen right angle from the screen, that goes away. So if your writing style is such that you hold the pen really vertically when you write, then this might work better. Yeah, there's kind of a noisy mess there. I think we might want to just try grounding to the charging cable just to get a cleaner signal. Tuco looks more comfortable than I think I know how to be. How much of this is intentional and how much of it's noise at this point? Okay, that's with the pen off. Okay, something is different with it on. Okay, so the like 128 megahertz or whatever is RF interference, but the little impulses are something from this. It's weird that it's correlated. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's see if we can take this apart. Seems like it might unscrew, but maybe not. It's not a striking color. That tube is glued into that tube. Mm. Oh, maybe it's not glued very much. Okay, so just a little twisting took the glue apart. 
I'm like a little wary if there being delicate wires inside that'll break. Um, these grooves are just to hold some glue, maybe. How long is it? I think that's reaching the end of the wire. Um, can we get this off? Oh, that is the edge of a battery. Okay, that's a little delicate. I'm guessing everything is just glued together at this point. That just looks kind of like the top of a cap, but it's kind of hard to tell if it's a cap or a battery. I wouldn't have expected it to arrive charged if it was the supercapacitor. There's a seam here. It looks like this whole tip has a smaller tube that maybe fits inside this tube. Yes, so this is gonna need some slack on those wires. And I think this is gonna give me the circuit board and the battery. Oh, great, that cap just comes off in its entirety. Maybe now I can push the button in. Interesting. Okay, yeah, this does seem to want to pull out now. Yeah, it's coming out a little bit. It's kind of hard to tell where I'm going to get stuck. It's very slippery. Yeah. It feels like it's glued under this logo, and then it's free to move under the button side. Oh, I think I just cracked this plastic. There we go. Oh, it is a weird micro USB jack. That's just the edge of the circuit board there, making contact with the power on ground. Yeah, that was the micro USB. That's an interesting cost saving measure. The circuit board is very thin. Hmm. There's the edge of the battery. I just clip those wires. Okay. That's interesting. That looks like a lithium battery. It says 3.7 volts. Um, it's just in a package that I would normally associate with a capacitor. This is just stuck on some very fragile pieces. So I'm trying to get this off carefully. There we go. Okay, so there's the little plastic shroud that holds the button in place. I think we're gonna take this to the microscope in just a sec, but let's try to get the rest of this apart. I think we just need to yank the end off of this. I think like kind of bending it until the glue cracks is what's necessary to get this apart. Oh, that, that took care of it. Okay, so we found the spring-loaded mount for the copper tip. Yeah, I was kind of hoping not to have to destroy this thing, but oh well. There's like a plastic bushing around that shaft here, which I seem to have parts of now. So this was just kind of the decorative surround, that metal that we were squishing. The actual tip is on this piece, but then this is the sleeve that the tip fits into. I'm not sure why this piece exists. That's interesting. And then how does this part work? Oh gosh, is that still glued? Oh, there's a metal tube here, which I seem to have separated instead of pulled out. Okay, the metal tube is still hard to get out of there. Um, this seems to be loosely attached still. Hmm. Maybe if I just kind of lightly squish the whole thing with the vise, that'll release the glue. 
this pen happens to be just a tiny bit smaller. I think it's glued in enough that I'm going to break it if I push it out this way. This, I think this is pushing directly on the circuit board. This metal is very thin, though. I could just try to open the metal right about here. Oh, I can kind of peel the whole enclosure apart this way, maybe. It does not seem like there's, there's going to be a way to non-destructively repair these things. And there's a sign of glue residue on that side. Pretty thin metal. It's just like this whole big flaky bit of glue right there. Kind of destroyed by all the vicing earlier, but still making this kind of stick. Cool. So I think we lost the black wire at some point, but that was attached over here. tube was surrounding these two plastic pieces. That's, that's interesting because like if I'm reading this right, we actually have three separate electrical contacts here. There's the very tip here. Then this spring, I think, was attached to the area around the tip. And then we've got the actual um, body of the pen here. Okay, so two circuit boards. Is that actually the wire going to the tip even? I think that is. Oh gosh, what is going on there? Did that happen? I think that just happened. Ooh, I don't think I did that though. See, 26. That looks like a soldering defect. That one was headed to the tip, and it just looks like there's a loop in it that's glued. Can we pull that apart? Ow. Speaking of slime, this is this little copper spring that I think was trying to make contact with the ring on the edge of the pin. Like, not the very, very tip, but the little ring. So that is this wire that I broke, which goes to the actual tip. This seems to be like a plastic coated piece of metal, like a metal tube with tape wrapped around it or something. And then on the end, that looks like maybe a copper rivet or something like that. The, the spring and this edge here are connected. Is that just ground? So, okay, so so far we've got ground on this clip, ground on the spring, and then two signal outputs. Yeah, there's just like one on each side. So this goes to C15 and C, what is that, 18, R6. And then this goes to R3, C14. This is the one that I would assume would be some kind of maybe active guard or something and not the actual signal that we're driving. Let's see what's on the other circuit board. It's labeled U, U16, like it's a chip, not a transistor. Um, that could be a regulator. It could be a switch. And BC1, what is that? Is that a capacitor? I don't know what that part is. And then U4, a chip with no labels. I wouldn't be surprised if this is some kind of generic power thing that's used for like night lights and electric cigarettes and a bunch of other things that have to be rechargeable and turn on for some amount of time. Maybe this board is boring and uh, let's look at the other board.
So this has four parts on the side that could be transistors. Four, four T's over there. A four, six, four here. So that could be a dual transistor package or some kind of IC. I don't see a designator for that one. This one's got yet another different marking, like MAE maybe. And then this side has something marked U which I was guessing before might be a voltage regulator. It draws 10 milliamps. That's the 3.7 volt input. Whoa, okay, this is some kind of oscillator. It would explain, explain some things if this was an inductor. Oh, interesting, LTIZ. So is this being used as a step up, I wonder, or, oh gosh, Tuco, hi. Tuco, you're kind of in the way. Normally the switching node would go between a coil and a diode. Let's see if we got that. Where else does that switching node go to? Is there a diode on the back side maybe? Oh, you know, I wonder if these are dual diode packages and maybe they're using this as a, a double-ended boost converter. This via down here is ground. It's just connected to the rest of the grounds. This via is the switching node from the LT1615, which looks like that. So, is most of that passing through these capacitors? Yeah, and that's the ground rail again. That is 27 volts, and that is minus 27 volts. So we've got a plus or minus 27 volt supply off of a single LiPo cell. So that's what this left section is for, in addition to the parts on the back side. A little wayward solder ball there. And then, so yeah, this is the feedback signal coming in at one point. 7, 1.2 volts, 1.25. So this is going to be compared to an internal voltage reference in here. And the output voltage, the, the fact that this is 27 volts, that's coming from the ratio set by these two resistors. Um, and then these are storage capacitors to just stabilize that 27 volt output. And I think we just have two different values of those. So we've got like a larger and a smaller in parallel. So everything to the left of this notch here is a plus and minus 27 volt power supply. That explains like half the circuit so far. Huh. I wonder if this is an op amp or something like that. So this has plus and minus 27 going to it. I mean, this could be some kind of dual transistor thing, but I'm guessing it's actually something a little higher level than that. This seems like the right waveform. Let's see what else we've got. That's one and a half volts. So. All these are pretty low level. I wonder if this is actually the noise generator and the other thing is amplifying it. They might have put the amplifier close to the power supply. Hey Tuco, don't walk it. Okay. You're the boss. I thought I was getting noise spikes there, but now I don't see them. Okay, this is the wire that would normally go to the tip. Hello? The tip wire, I would not expect to be ground. What about this ring coil? Oh, this is transmitting something. I wonder if this is trying, if this is actually responding to the signal that the tablet puts out in some way. The tablet here is trying to sense mutual capacitance by transmitting a signal from one electrode and receiving it on the other. One theory for how this works is that maybe this is an active amplifier, that what we were seeing before was in fact just noise being picked up by this amplifier. So it might be sensing the field at the very tip and then kind of broadcasting that out in the area, kind of like a finger would. I'm just going to put a somewhat stiffer wire on here. It does seem to detect a touch roughly in between those two wires. This isn't quite how the tip was originally built. I think that tube being grounded might have been important. Oh yeah, so I think this is... So the spring was it was pushing onto this kind of T-shaped piece. Okay, yeah, so I think... I'd be able to put this back together if I hadn't broken the wire. But that fits pretty tightly into this piece. The wire would be coming out this side if it wasn't broken. Because it seems kind of like a coaxial cable at this point. I wonder if we could just use coax with 
a flat end. Is this all just a metal tube and maybe that's paint? I think this is either self-oscillation or amplifying some other fr frequency that we've got in the environment. So I think right here, I'm picking up the signal from the tablet, but I'm not necessarily, the tablet isn't sensing it because I think I'm kind of keeping the transmitter too far away from the screen. What if I kind of hold the scope probe a little closer? Oh yeah, look at that. It's transmitting the signal back to the tablet kind of around where the scope probe body is. I think we figured it out, or at least I'm, I'm getting kind of happy with this explanation. This is much nicer than I was expecting. Yeah, it's a little hard to find regions of the screen where this kind of bad setup actually works. Over here, it seems all right. So I think the scope right now is synchronizing with some kind of arbitrary pulse that's happening at approximately the tablet scan rate. But then we're seeing the amplitude of the individual sense wires change as we move across the surface of the screen. Under the current set of assumptions, the top wire you're seeing here would be transmit and the bottom wire would be receive. And this is just a sim like a relatively simple amplifier. We could even just try that with a signal generator and just insert our own signal and see if this amplifies it effectively. I'm guessing these are op amps. I think that's a low pass filter and an AC coupling stage maybe. What a cat. It's not inductive, so there are many kinds of pens out there. There are inductive and capacitive, and powered and unpowered. So you, there are inductive powered pens, there are inductive passive pens. The Wacom pens are inductive and passive. The Huion pens are inductive and powered. The signal generator is supposed to be putting out like two volts here. Oh, that was it. Where is the bad connection? Oh, here's a bite mark on the cable. Is that where the bad connection is? Yes. <sighs> okay, so let's turn the power on. So that's the output of the amplifier. Let's turn this way down because two volts is way too much. Let's go back into the millivolts. That really fuzzy gross edge kind of changes as I change the amplitude of the input signal, but it's basically tracking. This is 10 millivolts on the input. I should probably just put a BNC with a 50 ohm termination on the end of this to do this experiment properly. And then I can use this central ground. Okay, so this is a 50 ohm resistor. That's the center of an SMA jack. Why is it so noisy? This is still like 20 millivolts. 70 millivolts. Okay, well, let's try the frequency. This is where we maybe get to figure out what the frequency selectivity of this thing is like. This is 100 hertz. This is tracking pretty well, yeah, 16 kilohertz. We're, we're getting all that nasty ringing on the edge, but the overall frequency is right. That is a lot of voltage swing on the output. 20 volts per division, so that's like 60 volts swing. Okay, we're finally getting a clear square wave at 170 kilohertz. And it starts to get unstable back around 150. This circuit is probably designed to be processing edges more so than sine waves. There's my square wave. You can see it's mostly locking on to noise and self-oscillating at this point. I'm seeing some attenuation now around one and a half megahertz. It's drawing 50 milliamps right now. And okay, now it's starting to lose the signal. The function generator is 3.4 megahertz right now. Four megahertz. It's like pretty much gone at this point. 
I think we were expecting that this might be just transmitting some fixed signal, either a square wave or some kind of spread spectrum noise. But yeah, this is much more interesting. It's actually sensing the signal that your touchscreen is putting out and then retransmitting it in a larger area to simulate having this meaty finger on the screen. It'd be interesting to design a 3D printed enclosure for this that has an LED or two at the end and just as like a tiny, tiny, thin flashlight. It's cool. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much for hanging out. This was a fun stream. It was not quite exactly what I expected, but I think it was pretty good. Um, these active styluses turned out to be pretty weird and interesting, and uh, it does seem like there's a couple more things I could do. I could try to draw a schematic of this. We could look up to try to find what the chips are by their markings or just look at how they're wired. We'll get back to more of this soon and uh, big thanks to everyone who hangs out as well as everyone who sends in hardware to work on and everyone who contributes to the Patreon to help keep this going. <laughs> See you next time. Oh, that's a bit much. Ah, this camera is actually pretty fun. Totally worth that, like, year of engineering work. So I can try to steer the camera over here to view the wind spinner, but it's going to want to hang out with the cat unless I lock it. And I think I should just let it hang out with the cat.